Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Right, so Phenomenology of Perception, still going, video 13, third and final section. We are in part two, talking about the perceived world and space. So this will be, the, like I said, this will be the last installment of video 13, and we're looking at lived space. So, so far, Malo-Ponte says, um, the way we've looked at space up until now is almost as if we are a disinterested subject not maybe not quite but you know because we've uncovered that our perception of space uh, is grounded in us being firmly set being anchored within a milieu right so it's not as if we're completely disinterested but there is this sense that so far we've looked at, at spatiality as it is kind of out there <clears throat> how we perceive it in the world, in, in amongst objective things. Um, and he says that explicitly determining spatial relations like this is a second order activity. And so this idea of lived space is going to, to be much more of, a, of an intimate kind of um, description of space, what space means for us as, as lived human beings as a lived experience and i'll read so i'll read a quote with for you to start off with in the natural attitude i have no perceptions i do not posit this object as next to that other one along with their objective relations rather i have a flow of experiences that implicate and explicate each other just as much in simultaneity as they do in succession and also in ordinary experience, we hardly perceive any objects at all, just as we do not see the eyes of a familiar face, but rather its gaze and its expression. Okay, so that's an interesting passage. <clears throat> We're talking about perception, but Malopondi is saying here, in that, that natural attitude, at the, the, um, the, the way that we fundamentally, normally, originally live, we don't have perceptions. We don't have these explicit perceptions. We don't posit this object as next to that one, or this one is bigger than that one. Um, rather, we have this these flow of experiences. Um, so it's all it's all non-thetic. It's all pre-thematic. Um, and so we, it, and it's so far that we don't even have perceptions. Malopondi says we don't have explicit perceptions we just live with these objects um, and as he says that we hardly perceive any objects at all it's um and it's a good analogy with thinking about someone's face we don't see their eyes we see their gaze we see what they are taking in we see that they're looking at us um, but we don't see their eyes as explicit objects um, so that that's a nice way to kick us off here. Um, he gives he compares this to the experience of someone who's taken mescaline, for whom the whole world kind of falls to pieces; it falls apart. And this he says is not because a um, a consciousness, some kind of you know pure mental entity has been altered nothing's been like changed with uh with a consciousness as such but rather the experience and the experience of mescaline um, the knowing body ceases to envelop objects in a single whole so it's it's again it's this it's not a it's not a clear way you know there's, there's no black and white there's no easy clear description here it's just it's it's ambiguous but that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about lived experience it is fundamentally ambiguous so any any descriptions that we might give you know it's also that description is necessarily going to be kind of ambiguous talking about the way that we hold the world we take a hold of it we um the way that we envelop objects so this degradation of of the body as a as a knowing subject as a knowing thing as a knowing object 
said a lot of things there. Um, but hopefully you get what I mean. <clears throat> this degradation of the body includes a degradation of time as well, um, which no longer rises towards a future, but falls back on itself. So this, um, it's, an, it's a nice way to think about um, the way that we normally experience the world and objects and spatiality by contrast to the, the way that someone who's taken mescaline experiences the world and everything falls apart. Um, again, not because something has been altered, some, some constituting consciousness has, has changed, but because the body no longer is no longer able to make sense of the world. It's no longer able to take things up um, in a way that makes sense, in a meaningful way. So, spatiality is always related to our anchorage in a world. We've seen that. Um, and because of that, every modality of that anchorage will have an original spatiality. So, after that, making that, that point, Malo Pondi then goes on to talk about these different modalities, these different types of experiences. Um, and and analyzes what spatiality is for each of them. So that won't make, won't make much sense now, but if I go through the, the modalities that he talks about, I think it will, it will become clearer. So the first one he talks about is night. And he says here that at night, the world of clear and articulated objects is abolished. So we no longer have, you know, everything's dark, um, maybe, if it's not pitch black, we, we see vague shapes, vague outlines of things, perhaps. But essentially, this is spatiality without things. It's um, spatiality in, in, a, in a modality that has no profiles, i.e. that of, of the night. So even so, at night, we have this particular way of, of um, experiencing spatiality. And it's a spatiality that is, as he said, without objects. There are no clear, definite objects. We have to grope our way through this, this um, unfamiliar and kind of alien space. So that's interesting. He talks about the modality of sleep as well. Um, and particular, particularly here, he talks about dreams and... Um, he has something interesting to say here. He says, dreams reveal the general spatiality in which space and objects are normally embedded. So if you have a dream um, where you are rising or, or, or floating up or the opposite falling also, they're often, he says, related to respiratory events or even sexual drives. Um, and so movement through space has this other signification it means something different in a dream so when you're in a dream if you're moving upwards perhaps you know that perhaps that, that correlates with some respiratory event or some some sexual urge or drive that, that you're experiencing at the time um, just before i go on not as signed to signify by the way not any time that there's we talk about signification here, it's not like like a telephone number is a sign of someone's um, of, of of a particular residence. Though it's not a there isn't there isn't separation here. The sign is not different from the thing it signifies. So um, this the spatiality in the dream, it's not it's not indicating something else. It's not. The respiratory event isn't something separate from that. The um, the sense of moving through space, rising or falling, it's 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 the same. That the 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 spatiality is the um, the event. The two are, are, are too closely intertwined to separate. As if there were there was a sign over here and something something separate, something different signified by it um, and so what 
what this this idea of spatiality and dreams reveals for us is that it gives us the living and sexual signification of up and down of directions in space they're made clear in the dream in the dream we can see um, you know more clearly than we can in normal waking life but the parallel is there space isn't this it's not this empty um, container it's not this neutral container we move through it's 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 a it's a crucial essential part of our um, of our lives <clears throat> and we don't we don't move through space so much as we live in space so that's cool and Malaponte says and it will come back to this later but he says here or actually he says later but it applies here as well spatiality is existential fundamentally it's it's not um, it's not indicative. It's not a, it's not a signpost to something else. The sign, uh, sorry, that the movement through space is itself existential. It has the significance within it, as in a dream where you're rising and it means something. It, it means a respiratory event or sexual, some kind of sexual urge or something. Um, so that was cool what what spatiality means in sleep then he also talks about myth um, in which he says direction and positions so space are determined by the placement of affective entities so things that have some kind of emotional draw for us or, or um, emotional significance some some type of intrinsic meaning or value for us um, become orientations for our sense of space for our sense of spatiality and the example he gives is of a um, I guess like a, a primitive um, tribe or a clan's encampment so where they where they're staying <clears throat> that that has a kind of um, draw it, it's almost like it's it's pulling them back so they can they have that sense of home there that's where their home is and it's 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 not real there's nothing objective about it hence the myth but it has an affective draw it has it has meaning um, in an emotional sense but that carries over into their spatial understandings their directions going north is no longer um, a compass point it's moving further away from our, our, our encampment our home so the, the space the spatiality the the compass points the compass directions take on this they have this extra meaning they have this this other um, depth overlaid on them and that's what spatiality is that's what lived space is for them and, he, and then he talks about our waking life as well. And the same thing is true here. And I've got a quote for you. Our body and our perception always solicit us to take the landscape they offer as the center of the world. But this landscape is not necessarily the landscape of our life. I can be elsewhere while remaining here. And if I'm kept far from what I love, I feel far from the center of real life beyond the physical or geometrical distance existing between me and all things, a lived distance links me to things that count and exist for me and links them to each other. At each moment, this distance measures the scope of my life. So, I mean, a nice description there. You know, the, um, the things around us that we're, we're, we're kind of called to um, to take these as the center of our world that's where we are but <clears throat> but we have this this other sense as well in which um, spatiality takes on meaning so if we're like he says if we're far from from what we love we can feel we're we're, we're not at the center anymore we're, we're removed in some way we're on the outskirts spatiality we, we feel that you know we're away from where we where we ought to be or where we're um, 
where we feel that, that that's where we, we'd like to be. And he gives an example of homesickness here, which is, is quite nice. You know, no matter where you are, if you're pining to be somewhere else, to be home, um, that that affects your all, all of your spatial sense, all of your spatial senses. Your your, your sense of, of spatiality is now located somewhere somewhere other than where you physically are. That's where um, things are kind of centered for you. And so um, that, that's a nice, a nice way to think about it. He also talks about schizophrenia here, um, which I think it's fairly well known. When I, when I was younger anyway, it, we used to think schizophrenia was um, what's now known as DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. So schizophrenia is just having hallucinations, delusions. Um, basically, it's it's a breakdown in normal reality. So it's 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 not it's not just you know hearing voices or, or multiple personality disorder or anything like that. So it's this breakdown of of um, how we normally understand the real around us. And this schizophrenia is is pre precisely what Merleau Ponty is talking about here. It's a break between existential and objective space. That those two things no longer overlap. So so the objective space around the individual no longer matches their their felt space, the space that they, that they're living. And so there's this disconnect. That's that's what gives. That's what creates that break, that, that separation that, that the schizophrenic feels. Um, so this is quite interesting. And um, it, I've never heard anybody talk about spatiality in these terms. And, and when I first read it, I, I struggled to see what he was getting at. Because, yeah, when, when we think about spatiality, and we're talking about perception, we think about, you know, objects and, and their relations and their positions to each other and their positions to me and, and all those things that we've talked about already in the, in the prior videos. But we don't think about things like, you know, space at night, space in our dreams, our dream space, our myth, myth, mythical space. Um, but I think that's a really, it's a really important insight that Milo Ponti's picked up on here. Um, and there are two points that I've written here that I wanted to note. What are they? Let's check it. Um, the first is that dream, myth, even poetic imagery are not connected to their sense through a relation of sign to signification. So this is that idea I was, I was talking about earlier. There's not the phone number and the subscriber. So we're not talking about two things that are separate. Rather, the, the dream, the myth, the, the lived space contains that sense. It contains the sense as a direction of existence. So it's important to, to, to make sure that we understand that it's not the, the, the spatial sense, the direction or the position. It's not indicating something else. It is that something else. The something else is contained in that. Um, and we've seen that before in, in prior videos way, way back. Um, but Milo Ponte keeps stressing it, which is, which is good because it's something that I think, you know, it's not, it's not intuitive perhaps. Uh, and the other thing, I, the other point I wanted to note is that spatiality always has existential implications. And the way I put it before is that spatiality always is existential. Um, and that's this idea of lived space. And the quote, just a short one, there is a determination of up and down, and in general, a determination of place that precedes perception. Life and sexuality haunt their world and their space. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's deeper than the, that Ponty called that second order activity. Of, of locating things in space, giving them a direction, giving them a, um, a distance from us. It's prior to all of that. And it's this, it's this deeper lived sense that Malo Ponte is getting at. 
So next, Meloponte considers an objection that you might have thought of while I was um, something else. Like I kind of hinted at it earlier, but talking about these things, dream space, mythical space, the space of the schizophrenic, are these real spaces? Can we really think of them as as genuine spaces? <clears throat> and he says, don't they depend on geometric space? Isn't geometric space this objective space, isn't that prior? Isn't that the real space? And these other things, these other kind of subjective um, felt senses of space, aren't they just illusory, kind of laid on top and, and um, less real in some way? So he says that regarding this, objective thought rejects these um, because... They can't be thematized and made explicit. So they reject the dream, the space of the dream, the mythical space. They reject all of these because they're, they're, they're not, they're indefinite, they're ambiguous. They're not, they don't admit of these clear cut categories and distinctions and, and kind of mathematical quantification that um, objective thought requires. And that's true. They don't. Um, but that's their strength. So there's no thematic sense to them. That's right. But there is a non-thematic sense. There's a sense. Um, it's not explicit. It's not. It's not calculable. But but there is still a sense to these um, forms of space. They are still genuine spaces, even though. Um, they can't be calculated. You can't measure them. And he says that this isn't lesser, in fact. In fact, the, the unreflected here sustains the reflected. It, it's prior. These, these, um, these lived spaces, the dream space, the mythical space, space at night, these are, um, these are the original our original mode of, of spatiality. These are, this is our original understanding of space. It's the thematized, reflective, second-order space, which is built on top of that. You know, so it's just this reversal of of the position that that we tend to have today, which is this <clears throat> science, science tells us what's really happening. And what you think or what you feel or what you experience, that's an illusion. That's, you know, you, if you want to know the truth, look at look to science, look to the objective. Um, and Meloponte is just, just flipping that on its head. The unreflected sustains the reflected. And the latter merely makes explicit the former. So the reflected, the objective, just clarifies. It, it, um, it turns... I mean, not clarifies is the right word. <clears throat> it turns what's unthematic into something thematic, but it doesn't. It doesn't thereby describe the real. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that the unthematic is therefore illusory. Um, as he says, it, it, the the unthematic um, supports and sustains the thematic. And so he says something kind of interesting here. Um, reflective analysis believes it knows the experience of the schizophrenic or the dreamer better than they do. I think that that's quite a nice way to put that. You know, the, the experience that the schizophrenic or the dreamer has is genuine. It's real. And we, we can't, you know, if we, if we take their, their experience and then try and fit it into our mathematical um, quantitative objective concepts then we're twisting it you know it's it's possible we can do that but we're 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 disregarding we're dismissing their experience and that again that's the fundamental that's the original experience that's the one that we Meloponte is focusing on and another thing he says which is interesting here likewise the philosopher believes that he knows what he sees better in reflection than he knows it in perception. And that's a great little, it's not a quote, but <clears throat> um, at least I haven't quoted it, but it, it's, it's straight out of the text, I think. 
Um, I love that. Yeah, the philosopher believes he knows what he sees better when he reflects on it, when he thinks about the ideas, the concept of it, rather than what he's actually seeing, what he's actually perceiving. And I'm just reminded of, of you know, contemporary philosophers. Always Dan Dennett pops into my head for this kind of thing. He's, it's, they're just like the classic example of this, you know. What, what, we, what I think I see is an illusion. This is what I really see, but I can't, I can't ever actually see it that way. But, um, but when I think about it, I can get a, I can get a better grasp of it. What I'm actually seeing, that's false. That's an illusion. It just seems totally backwards, you know. You to dismiss that just because it doesn't fit into, um, into a kind of analytical account of the universe, then we have to dismiss it. We have to get rid of it as. You know, as illusional, and even when they acknowledge, you know, um, I can't perceive any other way. I can't perceive reality as they put it, as they see it. Um, yet they insist that that this reality is 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 something that, or what they're actually experiencing isn't real. It's not. It's not the way things really are. That they, they are trapped in an illusion that they can't get out of. It's, it's very, <clears throat> very f interesting and kind of strange situation to, to, um, to watch. So Malopondi says, we can trust the dreamer's experience. We can trust their experience. And we, can, we just have to understand that they're talking about what they live, not an objective um, reality. And he, he gives a nice example here <clears throat> of a schizophrenic, someone suffering from schizophrenia, who um, sees or talks about a brush which is over there by the window, but they, they, they feel it as coming, approaching them and entering their head. So he feels, I don't, I don't know, he or she, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if this is an actual, I, I I assume it's an actual case that a schizophrenic sees this this brush come closer and and eventually enter their head, you know, penetrate their skull. Um, but what what's happening here when they're describing this, when they're talking about this, the brush that has approached them has come closer and buried itself in their head, is a, the prickly stiff thing which is embodied in the appearance. The brush by the window, the objective thing, the physical thing, is just an envelope or a phantom. The real brush, the essence of the brush, has, has crept closer and entered their head. In the same way, the, um, so the, the, the brush over there by the window, it's still there. They can still see it. They're not, they're not, they don't believe that the brush has actually moved. But, but they say, they still say that the brush has still entered their head. What's entered their head is the, that appearance, that the, 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 um, what makes the brush the brush, the prickliness, the stiffness of the bristles, that has entered their head. Um, so pointing out that the brush is still over there by the window is not going to change their, their mind because that brush over, by, over there by the window is just, um, an envelope. It's, it's an empty envelope now. And likewise, their, the head, when they say that the brush has entered their head, they don't mean this physical round shape on their neck. They mean the, their center of, of, of perception. They mean the, the power by which they perceive objects. That's, what's, that's what the brush has entered, not this physical lump you know um, and so it's it's we have to understand what they're talking about um, so objects remain out there objects you know physical objects don't change pointing that out doesn't change this the um, the schizophrenics beliefs because the hallucination is this contraction of lived space that's what's contracted here the, the brush has come closer through space to their head, um, not through physical space, 
but through their lived space, their, their space as they experience it. We, we can find geometrical space in this. We can, we can make that second order jump and describe what's happening in, in a geometrical, quantifiable, um, coordinate point system, you know, po uh, coordinate, what? Well, coordinate field, field of coordinates. Um, but these, this was not originally there. That's not the original um, perception. The original perception was this lived space um, prior to us imposing this geometrical space on it. Um, so, let's keep going. Mythical consciousness is a flow. Malo Ponte describes it as, which is a nice way to think about it. It doesn't focus on itself and know itself thematically. <clears throat> it's just pure experience. It's, it's in the moment. Um, so there are a couple of interesting things next. The first is that um, myth, he says, is not an explanation of the world or an anticipation of science. Um, and this kind of caught my eye because that's how I have seen and interpreted myth um, in the past especially you know we think about um, ancient mythologies involving you know deities and and, and all manner of supernatural beings um, causing you know storms and, and earthquakes and, and all these types of things and it's, it is easy and tempting to say that you know that they didn't understand what was happening these myths were designed to to alleviate that to it to, to kind of bring order to the world to, to make an explanation for something that they couldn't explain and in that sense we're treating them as as anticipations of science kind of pre-scientific um, explanatory tools but Malopont is saying that that's not what myth fundamentally is. Rather, it's a projection of existence. It's, it's, yeah, and so I like that. It's, um, to, to look back and see these myths as um, anticipations of science is only possible when you're looking back from a scientific world, when you're taking a scientific perspective on on their on these myths then you can read it in that light but i think i think malo ponti's right there's you know they're, they're not they weren't they weren't engaged in science they weren't engaged in any any kind of um explanatory behavior you know they were they were they were they were describing their lives they were they were seeing um and talking about their lives as as they lived them as they had meaning for them, it was it was never a rudimentary attempt at science, and um, to, to suggest that that's what it was, I think, is to look back with scientific goggles on and see everything through a scientific lens. But I think um, I think he's right; he's onto something there. This is that's not what myths were; they were a projection of existence. They were how. People lived their lives. They were they were what brought meaning, <clears throat> and and how they um, how they centered themselves in their um, in their lives. Another interesting point around this this section is um, when Malo Ponti talks about the dreamer who remembers nothing, the dreamer who doesn't know the dream. Rather, when, you, when you're recounting a dream, you're always awake. It's the waking person who remembers the dream, not the dreamer. And that's interesting to think about. So he says, if we didn't wake, the dreams would be instantaneous modulations. You know, we, we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't reflect on them the same way that we reflect on them when we're, when we're awake. And the same can be said, the same is true of, of our normal waking lives. When we think back on them, when we reflect on what we're doing, how we're, we're perceiving, 
when we reflect on space, that's not what space originally was for us at the time we were experiencing it. So that's a nice analogy that I think makes this point quite, quite forcefully. Um, and finally, he says here, all of these lived spaces are themselves built on a natural, non-human world. And that's going to be the subject of the next chapter. But before we get to that, I want to look at um, one more part, one last part, where he talks about the apparent and the real. So here, Milo Ponti talks about, or he says, if the existential spaces that we're talking about here, these lived spaces, are possible, then the apparent and the real must remain ambiguous. So what this is, is a, it's a rejection of, of the claim that the apparent is the real, that appearance is reality. Now, I, I don't know who he's responding to here. He must be responding to someone. I don't think it's Sartre. But, um, yeah, so he's definitely disputing this claim that appearance is reality, the apparent is the real. And he says that if this were the case, there could be no illusion, because any illusion would appear as what it really is, as illusion. If the appearance is is, is the real, is, is what it really is, then because illusion appears for us, it would appear as what it is, as an illusion. And all perception, genuine perception, would appear, which appears, would also appear as what it really is, genuine perception. And that would mean that there's no confusion between the two. There's no ambiguity there. Um, and, and this is not the way that things appear for us. Illusion doesn't present itself as illusion and perception doesn't guarantee its reality. <clears throat> there is this disconnect between the way things appear and what they really are or what is real. So, um, so where does this leave us? If appearance is reality, then there's no illusion. We've, we've just looked at that. But if appearance is not reality, then everything's an illusion. And we, we can't get any certainty on anything. And this position is skepticism. And that the former, the former, if appearance is reality, there's no illusion, that's rationalism. <clears throat> so that, that's the way Merleau Ponty's framing this. But it's kind of a... Um, a battle between rationalism in which appearance is reality um, and skepticism in which appearance is not reality so I think that that's okay that's cool so the resolution then the way that Milo Ponti wants to resolve this because we, neither of those are tenable um, is to say that the two the two positions aren't mutually exclusive Every rationalism admits of at least one absurdity, namely that it must be formulated as a thesis. Every philosophy of the absurd recognizes at least one sense in the very affirmation of absurdity. I can only remain within the absurd if I suspend every affirmation. <clears throat> so, okay, we've got rationalism, but a rationalism, any rationalist position might be wrong. It could be wrong. It has to admit that, and that's why it has to be formulated as a thesis. It has to have argument. It has to, has to, um, it has to support itself and, and, um, and make its claims, which means that it could be wrong. And this, the opposite's the same is true for um, skepticism in the opposite way. To, to be, to claim that all appearance is not reality. You have to have at least one sense, there has to be one sensible proposition in there, namely that, that all appearance is not, reali is not reality. Um, so you can only remain in the absurd, you can only maintain skepticism if you say nothing, if you don't hold a position at all. Um, so he says, to remain in absolute evidentness, 
which is rationalism, or absurdity, which is skepticism, requires not making any affirmation at all, not having any position, not, not drawing any conclusions, taking no stand in the world. Um, in order, if we want to go from this interrogation, this mode of questioning what the world is or how things are, if we want to go from that to affirmation, to an expression, to, to believing in something, to, to acting in the world as if something were the case, to do that is to crystallize a collection of indefinite motives. And that's a quote which I like. We have to, <clears throat> in order to live, in order to act, in order to be in the world, we have to crystallize a collection of indefinite motives. We have to throw ourselves into the world, even though it's ambiguous, even though we're unclear, even though there's no certainty, there's no guarantees. Um, we have to immerse ourselves in it. That's that's the only way. That's the only way forward. There, there is no other option. Um, and I've got a quote here. Rationalism and skepticism sustain themselves upon the actual life of consciousness that they both hypocritically imply, without which they could be neither thought nor even lived, and in which one cannot say that everything has a sense or that everything is nonsense, but merely that there is sense. So that's cool. That's a nice kind of middle path. We can't say everything has a sense, the rationalist position. We can't know everything. We can't break everything down according to logic and reason. Um, and we can't say everything's nonsense the way that the skeptic wants to. Everything's an illusion. Everything's illusory. We can't know anything. All we can say is that there is sense. And this is what it is. My lived experience. Um... So I've written something else here. Let me see if I can read it. I can't posit the identity of being and appearing. I can only live it prior to all explicit affirmation. Yeah, so I can't say anything about being and appearing, whether they're the same, whether whether what, what appears for us is real or, or, or unreal. All I can do is live it. And, and that means ambiguously necessarily okay cool and then he goes on to say that still consciousness is always consciousness of something right so what is this something then that we're conscious of um, and he says in, co in consciousness appearance is not being rather it's phenomenon and that's now we've come back to that <clears throat> That idea, the phenomena. Um, so appearance is not being, it's phenomenon. That which is lived by me. In the same way that, that the dream is dreamed by the dreamer. There's no, the, the question of is, is appearance being, is it real, is it, is it all illusion? These things all... Um, they're, they're, in a way, they're, they're pointless, they're meaningless diversions. If you want to act in the world, if you want to get into the world, there's only one way, and that's um, by living it. And that's what phenomenon is. That's what, that's what phenomenology is. Um, and so this new consciousness, this, phenom this phenomenal consciousness, is then prior to truth and error. We're stepping backwards from that, from, from making these truth, false claims to just acknowledging what we, what we see, what we perceive, what we experience, <clears throat> and living it. And he has a, a good example, which I'm going to relate to you. He's, he talks about believing that he sees a stone in the distance. But actually, it's just sunlight reflecting off um, <clears throat> the ground. So he, he thinks there's a stone there, but there isn't. It's just sunlight. And he says that he doesn't see this. He doesn't see the flat stone the same way that he'll see the sunlight when he gets closer. 
that is to say, in complete clarity. The stone that he that he thinks he sees in the distance is, <clears throat> and this is a quote, he sees it in a field whose structure is confused and where the connections are not yet clearly articulated. So, yeah, he sees the stone. He thinks it's a stone, but it's in the distance. It's not the way that he's he's able to, to grab hold of it is not in this clear and definite manner. <clears throat> so the illusion appears then in a field that he is not geared into. He's not fully geared into this. He's not he doesn't have a full take on this this the field in which the stone appears. Yet he can be completely taken in by the illusion. So we can also experience that where we, we think something is absolutely certain. We believe it to be the case. <clears throat> We're completely taken in by the illusion. In which case, we see it in the sense that our entire perceptual and motor field gives me the sense of whatever it is, the stone. And so he, he, he walks forward, he moves forward, his body is geared into... The, the, the situation as if there is a stone there and he puts his foot forward to step on a stone which he believes is there and he may at that point discover that he was wrong it isn't a stone it's just just a patch of reflected sunlight <clears throat> um, but that's okay that's that's still a genuine experience and that's still um, it's that's what it means to live a human life. We say we perceive correctly when my body has a precise hold on the spectacle, but, and this is the important point, my hold is never complete. Rather, and I like this, we put our trust in the world. To perceive is suddenly to commit to an entire future of exper experiences in a present that never, strictly speaking, guarantees that future. To perceive is to believe in a world. It is this opening to a world that makes perceptual truth possible, or the actual realization of a vanimum, <clears throat> perception or awareness. Okay, so that's cool. So there, there is no absolute certainty in this world. There is no, um, you know, we can't, it, there is ambiguity built into into the core here there's no there's no there's no way we can escape that um, but when we perceive what we're doing is committing to we're putting our faith our trust in the world that it is a certain way um, and we're, we're trusting a present that never guarantees a particular future to perceive is to believe in a world i mean just so quotable so quotable this guy um, and it's this, I like this, it's this, this opening, this, this, um, this faith that you put, this trust you put in the world that, that makes perceptual truth possible or the actual realization of a perception of an awareness. And without that, there is no perception. Without that, we're standing, we're standing back aloof um separate from from the world rationalizing attempting to 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 formulate theories or criticizing all theories as as all you know as all wrong the, the, a way to think about this is like the rationalist and the skeptic both at the start line not prepared to run the race the rationalist because um now I've gone I've gone off on this um, on this analogy. Let's see if I can bring it home. Um, the rationalist doesn't want to go forward because they haven't yet. They're not certain of, of where where the route goes, or you know they can't see beyond the next corner. Um, they're still calculating the distance. They're still they're still working through the, these details which they'll never be able to complete. And the skeptic doesn't want to start because 
they don't believe that anything's happening. They don't believe that, you know, if they step forward, they don't know that perhaps, perhaps what they thought was the ground is actually an abyss. Um, so nothing's clear, nothing, everything's, everything's an illusion. It's too dangerous to go forward. Whereas a phenomenologist leaps into the world, takes that, that, that leap of, of faith, the leap back to Kierkegaard. But um, very different situation, but, um, but interesting. Um, and, and gets into it, gets on with it, lives the, lives the life, runs the race. Um, <clears throat> so that's cool. And he says, though, we, uh, and this is interesting, we can, there is absolute certainty in a world in general, just not of particular things. So we do have, um, we can believe in, in the, a world in general. It's the, it's the finer details, it's the specifics that, that can be illusory. And any, any position we take on those is always subject to future falsifiability. Cool, no worries. That idea of the world, we can, we can trust the world in general, I think we'll come to that in the next section. So hold off on that. <clears throat> um, the last thing, the last point I've got here is that this is the situation where we're, we're uncertain. Any position we take is always subject to future falsifiability is not a problem that we need to overcome. It's not a deficiency. Um, it's it's necessary if we want to have consciousness of anything at all. It's necessary if we want to have perceptions. It just has to be that way. That's that's what that's what it means for an object to appear as an object. <clears throat> and in this sense, consciousness is um, distant from being, not distant in the way that that constituting consciousness is but distant in the sense that it's, there is a, a gap, there is a, an epistemological um, gap between, between consciousness and being. And this ties back in with what we've said before too, right, about things holding something back from us. They, they never give themselves to us in their entirety. They never lay themselves bare before us. And I, I talked about that as the the thing having a kind of density that um, that if we got rid of that, we might know the thing in its entirety, but we'd lose the sense of, of a thing at all. It would become completely transparent and, and lose its thingness. Um, and the same way that... Um, we also, we've also talked about never knowing ourselves completely as a knowing consciousness, as a knowing um, entity, as a knowing being. We never know ourselves as that, as the knower. You know, we, whenever we reflect on ourselves, we're always reflecting kind of too late, as it were. We, we can never get fully behind ourselves to see ourselves um, <clears throat> as the perceiver. We never see our eye as the, the thing that is um, seeing. We see it as a thing seen. So, um, so that, that comes back into this as well. Nevertheless, we're distant from being in this way, but we're nevertheless united with being in that pre-conscious possession of the world, in that non-thematic, phenomenal field, which... Um, which is so crucial to Malo Ponte's philosophy. Cool. So that space. Now I'm going to hit you with a, a fairly long summary, um, covering the the last three videos. So let's get to that. Okay. So first we looked at um, space, just a general kind of definition, the means by which the position of things becomes possible. So that was in the, the context of space not being a container, not being something that um, a constituting consciousness kind of creates out of nothing, as it were. Um, different aspects of spatiality. We looked at direction. Uh, and here we focused on that spatial level where <clears throat> the body was an agent, an, an, an acting force. 
um, and how things oriented themselves around us as as an actor. And then we went beyond that to this primordial spatiality where the body was an impersonal connection. Um, and that was that non-thetic, back to that phenomenal field. Then we looked at depth. And we talked a lot about apparent size and convergence and the way that these were motives, um, not, not cause and effect causes that, um, that determined any, the, the, the determined distance or depth. Um, we looked at the way that our gaze attempts to see something. And when we, when we see, when we look at something, we grasp the whole, we have this whole understanding of a thing we and we talked about a cube a lot with that and this brought us back to a primordial depth which was the hold of our phenomenal body on its surroundings in the last video we looked at movement and saw that this was not a progression through a series of points which gives us Zeno's paradox um, and we divided, divided things into two kinds of objects, movable objects and moving objects. So, so movement could only be understood by appreciating that a moving object is different from a movable object. Um, and we saw that the movement was not relative. So this was, um, we talked about Einstein. Did we talk about Einstein? We talked about the scientific understanding of, of we did, I think I didn't mention him, but, but he was in the background there. Um, it's not relative. There's, um, we talked about figure and background, and that links in with the last point here. All movement passes through our body, um, and in the, in the form of anchorage points, which, which act as, well, anchors <clears throat> um, for a figure to move on which, on which a figure can move. Uh, lived space. We looked at um, spatiality always having existential implications, and it's even better to say spatiality is existential. We talked about a whole different range of um, spaces, so the dream space, myth space, schizophrenic space, and all of those, and, and we saw that they're all genuine, um, which was a very interesting thought. And the other thing that was kind of interesting in this video was the, the apparent being neither real nor unreal. Rather, it's phenomenon, which meant that it was ambiguous and um, something we had to throw ourselves into. And so that is this video, video 13, um, and we're done with the perceived world. So I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching. Thanks for putting up with me and my um, perhaps overly verbose explanations. But um, I, I mean, and I hope you're, you're getting as much out of this as I am. I'm just having to um, put all of my thoughts together and, and try and explain this as clearly as possible is, is um, it's, it's great for me, you know, I can just, it really helps me clarify these ideas. And if I didn't do this, I don't think I'd have anywhere near as, um, <clears throat> as, as thorough, as far as it is thorough um, understanding of, of this book. So win-win, hopefully. Um, anyway, thanks again for listening and I will catch you in the next video.